we are going to continue with chapter 40, part 5. Okay, now let's talk about foreign body aspiration. It's a higher risk among small children, usually between the ages of 1 to 3 years of age. Common objects that are aspirated are beads, paper clips, erasers, small rocks, hot dogs, peanuts, popcorn, hard candies, marbles, Legos, and coins. Severity is dependent upon the location, the type of the object, and the extent of the obstruction. Symptomology relates to the location and the extent of the obstruction. Diagnostic evaluation can include a chest x-ray or bronchoscopy. Uh, most aspirated bodies are radiolucent, but the bronchoscopy provides a definitive diagnosis. Therapeutic management uh, for choking follow current recommendation for emergency treatment, which includes the use of abdominal thrusts for children over a year old and back blows for infants. Bronchoscopy and endoscopy is used to remove the foreign body and it requires sedation. For nursing care, the major focus is on education regarding the prevention of aspiration. It's important that you recognize the signs of a uh, foreign body aspiration, you want to implement the appropriate emergency measures and recognize the signs of respiratory distress. Okay, now we're going to talk about aspiration pneumonia. Children with feeding difficulties are at risk. Prevention of aspiration is the focus of nursing care. Proper feeding techniques should be implemented and children should be placed in an upright position following feedings. The child who is at risk for vomiting should be placed in a sideline recovery position. Management and care is the same as the care provided for any type of pneumonia. You want to see the nursing alert on page 1220 of your textbook. When discussing pulmonary edema, uh, the pathophysiology is the movement of fluid into the lungs. There are two types, there's the cardiogenic and the non-cardiogenic. Cardiogenic is an increase in pulmonary capillary pressure due to an increase in the pulmonary venous pressure. It's caused by fluid overload, left ventricular failure, heart valve disorder, myocardial damage, myocarditis, sepsis, acute tachydysrhythmias, or coronary artery sclerosis. The non-cardiogenic is caused by various conditions that result in increased capillary permeability, such as acute respiratory distress, um, ALI, high altitude, or neurogenic conditions. Symptoms include shortness of breath, cyanosis, tachypnea, diminished breath sounds, anxiety, agitation, confusion, diaphoresis, orthopnea, respiratory crackles, exp uh, expiratory wheezing, heart murmur, S3 heart sound, JVD, non nocturnal dyspnea, pink frothy sputum, tachycardia, hypertension, or hypotension if it is caused by a left ventricular dysfunction. So for treatment in nursing care, it's therapeutic management and depends on the cause. You'll need oxygen therapy, PEEP via CPAP, intubation with ventilator support, uh, mad dogs such as morphine, aminophylline, digitalis, diuretics, oxygen, blood gases. And in nursing care, the child with pulmonary edema is similar to that of any other acute respiratory condition. You want to monitor the pulse ox, the ABGs, the intake and output, and assess respiratory status frequently. Okay, for acute respiratory distress syndrome and acute lung um, injury, uh, it's characterized by respiratory distress and hypoxia within 72 hours after a serious injury or surgery. Causes can be sepsis, trauma, drug overdose, near drowning. So basically the pathophysiology is the hallmark is increased permeability of the alveolar capillary membrane that results in a PE. Um, during an acute phase, inflammatory mediators cause damage resulting in interstitial edema, and then later stages are characterized by uh, pneumocyte and fibrin infiltration of the alveoli resulting in healing or fibrosis. Fibrosis will result in respiratory distress and need for mechanical ventilation. Lungs become stiff due to surfactant 
inactivation impairing the diffusion of oxygen, ultimately leading to decreased residual capacity, pulmonary hypertension, and increased intrapulmonary right to left shunting of the pulmonary blood flow. Signs and symptoms can include um, that the child will only show symptoms of infection or injury, but will hyperventilate, have increased respirations, and increased respiratory effort with cyanosis, and decreasing pulse ox as their condition declines. So treatment involves supportive care, identification and treatment of the underlying condition, and ventilator support. Uh, nursing care you may have intensive care during the acute stages. You want to monitor respiratory, acid base, cardiac, and nutritional status. Diuretics such as Lasix may be administered to reduce pulmonary fluid. Vasodilators such as calcium channel blockers may be administered to reduce pulmonary vascular pressure. A prognosis is usually that the mortality rates remain high, ranges from 18% to 49% for children, despite an improvement in the prognosis rates. The most outcome is associated with uncontrolled sepsis, bone marrow transplantation, cancer, and multiple organ dysfunction with the liver failure. Smoke inhalation injury may cause carbon monoxide poisoning. There's three stages. There's the early carbon monoxide poisoning, airway obstruction, and pulmonary edema. Acute respiratory distress syndrome and is usually about 24 to 48 hours. They may have bronchopneumonia after 72 hours that can cause atelectasis and pulmonary emboli. Treatment in nursing care is uh, treatments for symptomatic, see page 1222 of your textbook. Nursing care is the same as with any child with respiratory distress. You want to administer oxygen, uh, strict, accurate eyes and O's. Uh, you want to assess the vital signs. The O2 sap may appear to be normal in carbon monoxide poisoning. You want to have assessment of an ABG report. Uh, intubation supplies should be kept readily available at the bedside. Respiratory arrest can occur suddenly in kids with a smoke inhalation injury. And then we may have a hyperbaric oxygenation that's used for treatment in severe carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay, then we have tobacco smoke exposure. There's passive as a secondhand smoke. It occurs when someone is smoking near or in the presence of the child. Third-hand smoke occurs when someone smokes away from the child, but the child is exposed to the smoke. Remaining on the caregiver occurs regardless of where the person smoked. They can smoke outside and still bring it in. Scope of the problem. Indoor exposure to smoke is linked to the development of asthma. Asthmatic children of parents who smoke have a higher incidence of exacerbations, ER visits, medication use, and impaired recovery with acute asthma attacks. Effects on their growing fetus, uh, smoking results in fetal growth restriction, increases likelihood of preterm delivery, and increases chance of stillbirth. Effects on children. The antenatal smoking increased risk of SIDS in addition to risk of asthma development. Children exposed to smoke in childhood have an increased risk of the development of chronic lung disease as an adult. So nursing care management should focus on smoking cessation education. Do not avoid the subject because it is a tender subject with parent, patients and parents. Uh, for parents that refuse to stop smoking, educate on ways to reduce the child's exposure to second and third hand smoke. Smoke away from the home, not in the car. Take a shower, wash hair, change his clothes before interacting with the child after smoking and etc. Let's talk about asthma. It's chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. They have recurring symptoms. There's bronchial hyperresponsiveness or airway obstruction. There's limited airflow or obstruction that reverses spontaneously or with treatment. You want to look at box 40-13 of your textbook, asthma severity classification in children ages 0 to 11 years. So for precipitating or aggravating factors for asthma, there's outdoor allergens such as grasses, pollen, spores, indoor allergens such as mold and dust, cigarette smoke, sprays, wood smoke, exposure to chemicals, cold air, changes in weather or temperature, and strong odors such as perfumes. Foods could be milk or dairy products, nuts, sulfite additives, 
respiratory infections, medications such as aspirin, antibiotics, or NSAIDs, exercise, animal dander, look at box 40-14 on page 1224 of your textbook. For diagnosis, there's a pulmonary function test are the most accurate test for diagnosing asthma in its severity. There's also arterial blood gases, uh, decreased partial pressure oxygen, um, partial pressure carbon dioxide may be decreased in early stages of an attack due to the child's increased work of breathing, but will rise as fatigue sets in. Chest x-rays used to diagnose changes in chest structure over time. Allergy skin testing is done to detect inhaled antigens. There may be a RAST profile, that's a radioallergosorbent, which identifies allergies to specific foods. So nursing assessment, you're going to look at the general appearance of the child. It may show enlargement of chest wall, um, anterior or posterior diameter, uh, obtain a history regarding current and previous asthma exacerbations, including onset and duration of attack, precipitating factors, changes in medication regimen, medications to relieve symptoms, other medications taken, and self-care methods used to relieve symptoms. During an attack, you want to assess the respiratory rate, the rhythm and the effort, the use of accessory muscles, pulse ox, present of cough, uh, presence of sputum, color consistency and amount, skin color, capillary refill, chest percussion, and auscultation of lungs. Clinical manifestations during attack include a non-productive hacking cough, cough becoming productive of clear frothy sputum, shortness of breath, agitation and anxiety, extended expiratory phase of respirations, lips taking on a deep dark red color, progressing to a cyanotic nail beds and circumoral cyanosis, then there's poor oxygen saturation, sluggish, sluggish capillary refill, panting, short phrases spoken, percussion producing hyperresonance, expiratory and expiratory wheezing heard throughout lung fields becoming higher pitch, breath sounds that are loud and coarse, crackles. Look at box 40-15 for clinical manifestations of asthma. For interventions, nursing interventions, um, treatment during an attack includes maintaining a calm and reassuring demeanor to decrease fear and thus reduce respiratory effort and consumption of oxygen. Administering oxygen therapy is prescribed, monitor oxygen saturation and ABGs, placing the child in Fowler's position to facilitate air exchange, monitoring cardiac rate and rhythm for changes during acute attack, initiating and maintaining IV access, administering medications as prescribed. Okay, so let's discuss treatment. Beta-2 adrenergic agonists are bronchodilators that can be given orally or by inhalation. They may be, may be used for short-term prophylaxis, relief of acute attacks, and long-term control. They act by selectively activating the beta-2 receptors in the bronchial smooth muscle resulting in bronchodilation. As a result of this, bronchospasm is relieved. Histamine release is inhibited. Ciliary motility is increased. Glucocorticoids prevent inflammations, suppress airway mucus productions, and promote responsiveness of beta-2 receptors in the bronchial tree. The use of glucocorticoids does not provide immediate effects, but promotes decreased frequency and severity of exacerbations and acute attacks. Therefore, anti-inflammatory agents are used for long-term prophylaxis, not for stopping an ongoing asthmatic attack. Medications can include albuterol, inhaled, short-acting, um, severant, inhaled, long-acting, prevents uh, nighttime symptoms for exercise-induced asthma. We have brethine, which is oral, long-acting, pomacort, inhaled, prednisone, short-term use following acute asthma attack, chromalin, sodium, NSAIDs, uh, prophylactic, prescribed before exercise, leukotriene modifiers, such as Accolade, Zyflo, and Singular, it's used in older children with other meds for long-term asthma control. There's theophylline, it's used rarely due to potential for serious side effects, toxicity. Symptoms include restlessness, tremor, headache, tachycardia, abdominal pain, low blood pressure, and diuresis. 
Nursing implications. When the child is prescribed an inhaled beta-2 agonist and an inhaled glucocorticoids, advise the child to inhale the beta-2 agonist before inhaling the glucocorticoid because the beta-2 agonist promotes bronchodilation and enhances absorption of the glucocorticoid. CPT is indicated to assist the child to strengthen respiratory muscles, promote physical and mental relaxation, and improve breathing patterns, and it should not be used during an acute attack. You want to provide teaching to the child and or family about ways to avoid factors that aggravate or precipitate the episodes of asthma. Assist the child or family to eliminate allergens in the environment. Pets in the home, prepare meals with foods that contain no allergens. Enforce no smoking policy in the car or in the house. Keep air and heating ducts clean. Change filters monthly. Keep the child's room as clutter-free as possible, eliminating unnecessary rugs, curtains, and toys. Launder the child's clothing daily. Encourage a daily shower or bath. Promote indoor play during high pollen season. Use hot water to launder bed linens and pillows. Use non-allergenic bedding in case bedding in allergen protective covers. Keep furniture, floors, and walls clean and dry. Advise to the child or the family to avoid other aggravating factors by maintaining the humidity in the home between 30 to 50 percent with the use of a dehumidifier or air conditioner and avoiding excessive temperature extremes. Ensure adequate understanding of medication regimen. Provide instruction in the use of equipment. Uh, promote general good health practices, including balanced diet, good hygiene with appropriate hand washing, appropriate exercises and rest, and maintaining follow-up care. And then limit the child's exposure to infection. An annual flu vaccine should be obtained for the child with persistent asthma. Teach the child and her family to manage asthma by measuring the PEFR, that's the peak expiratory flow rate, by using a PEFM, a peak expiratory flow rate meter. You want to see patient teaching box on page 1233 of your textbook. Okay, let's talk about status asthmaticus. This is a continued severe respiratory distress that is not responsive to drugs, including epinephrine and aminophylline. It's a medical emergency. It requires immediate admission to ICU, oxygen via nasal cannula, avoidance of mist tints. The mist can actually cause coughing or wheezing. You want to monitor vital signs. You want to comply with prescribed medication regimen. You want to promptly seeking care. You want to minimize exposure to known allergens. And they must have a medical ID bracelet. See page 1229 of your textbook. This concludes part 5 of chapter 40.